Uh, good afternoon. I'm Dr. Vinay Ariratna. I'm the president of the Sri Lanka Medical Association. It's my pleasure to welcome all of you uh, to our monthly clinical meeting, which is focused on tropical infections. And uh, we have a very eminent panel today uh, to uh, present uh, on three different uh, topics. Uh, so we have uh, Professor Uday Ralapanava, who is a professor of professor in medicine at the University of Peradeniya, and Professor uh, Manoji Patiregi, who is professor in medicine at the University of Peradeniya, and also the uh, professor, also Professor Chamara Dadugaman, professor in medicine at the University of Peradeniya. So as you all know, uh, Sri Lanka Medical Association has this monthly clinical meeting uh, focusing on an important uh, uh, clinical or public health issue, and uh, we give the best of uh, uh, research update and what is the uh, clinical uh, uh, procedures or whatever that is now recommended. So it's very uh, important that uh, <clears throat> we keep uh, uh, updated, uh, up, we keep our uh, members, doctors updated with these uh, guidelines. So it's my great pleasure to start the meeting on this uh, uh, theme, uh, tropical infections. Uh, invite Professor Chamara Dalugama to make a presentation on uh, meliodosis, uh, a great masquerade in the tropics. Over to you, uh, Professor Dalugama. Good afternoon and thank you very much, sir. And it's a pleasure to be at SLMA in the Vijayaram House uh, delivering a speech. So before I start on my topic, first I would like to talk very briefly about what CRTM is all about, Center for Research in Tropical Medicine. So tropical medicine is a very attractive field of study. And then Sri Lanka being a tropical country, it's a hot spot with a diversity of tropical infections. But unfortunately, just like other tropical countries, the tropical diseases are being neglected, unseen, and confined to the poor developing nations. So with that in mind, the concept of forming a center for research in tropical medicine was rooted in the Faculty of Medicine, University of Peradenia in 1985. And this, in 1994, it became a UGC approved center. As you can see, Professor S. A. Arsakularatna is the founder director of the CRTM, who carried out a lot of research in tropical medicine with his international collaborations. And he was succeeded by Professor Nimal Sena Nayaka, who again did a lot of research, particularly related to toxicology in tropical countries. And the current director, Professor S. N. Kularatna, at the moment, the CRTM is carrying out a lot of research work as well as educational activities. So uh, the vision of the CRTM is to achieve excellence in tropical medicine and mission to initiate, promote, and facilitate research in tropical medicine with reference to Sri Lanka. So far, we have conducted two international conferences in tropical medicine, one in 2015 and one in 2017. And this is one of the landmark events of CRTM, the publication of a textbook in tropical medicine with special reference to Sri Lanka. And in addition to research, we do carry out a lot of educational activities, a monthly CME update. And also, this is one of such activities that we are conducting today. So coming to my topic, melioidosis, a great masquerade in the tropics. So before I start my topic, I would briefly go through a very interesting story. It's a rather unfortunate story, uh, which dates back to uh, 2021 in the United States. So I will name this story as mysterious fatal infections. So during this period, March to July 2021, there was one patient reported from Kansas, a 55-year-old female with background COPD, liver disease, and ethanol excess, who admitted with pneumonia and septic shock, and she dies. And the postmortem reveals multiple unnatures. Around this period, a four-year-old boy from Texas, again, presenting with the same 
complaint, a pneumonia with sepsis, but luckily he survives. And another patient, a 53-year-old male from Minnesota, coming with septic shock, pneumonia, and septic arthritis, he also has a big, large morbidity, but he survives. And the final patient is again a young boy, a five-year-old boy from Georgia, sepsis with pneumonia. And this boy dies on day four of admission and post-mortem reveals multiple lung and brain abscesses. So these are four patients, thousand miles apart in big United States, but the epidemiologists, the physicians, they were trying to link these four patients. And what they found was, they found all patients' cultures isolating a pseudomonas species. And then it was confirmed as Burkholderia pseudomelia. So that is the organism that causes melioidosis. But this was the talk of the town in the United States because, I mean, of course, Sri Lanka, we do see a lot of patients with melioidosis, but this was new for them. Having melioidosis in four patients in states, but none of them had traveled to tropical countries. So they were trying to explore a connection with the tropical countries among these four patients. So they screened all the items that these patients have been exposed to for pseudomania. And then they found this one in the patient number four's household. So the patient number four is that young boy from Georgia. And they found an aromatherapy bottle at home that they have been, the family has been using. And they found the pseudomonas organism in this bottle. And then the same genetic footprint was found in all bacteria in all four patients. And then they were surprised to see all four houses had the same brand aromatherapy bottle at home. And then they did the genetic footprinting and all these uh, genetic modeling. And then they found the same strain clustering to a sample of Burkholderia pseudomelia from South Asia. And then just like Sri Lankan newspapers, this was the talk of the town, the US, all newspapers were talking about them. And these are some of the newspaper cuttings. Mysterious fatal infection tied to room sprays all day all. India made spare link to rare illness in US, likewise. So all the Walmart users were advised to stop using this product immediately and to return whatever the aromatherapy bottles that they have purchased. And then those who were exposed to this aromatherapy <coughs> bottle within last seven days were started on post-exposure prophylaxis. So this is something very new that we never talk about meliodosis, about post-exposure prophylaxis, but uh, the CDC and the other uh, IDA uh, units advocated staff five hypopin sulfamethoxazole or four amoxiclav for patients who were exposed to infused aromatherapy spray within seven years. So that's the interesting but rather unfortunate story of melioidosis non tropical. So coming back to melioidosis, it's a gram negative bacterium. And it is commonly found in the rhizosphere and the surface groundwater of tropical and subtropical regions. What this rhizosphere means is it is the soil which is around 10 centimeters below the surface. So, what happens is during rainy season, this Burkholderia uh, pseudomonia, the organism, will move up to the surface layers for application. And during the rain, very rainy season, our farmers dig the soil and get the rhizosphere up to the surface. So they either, so they get exposed to this organism. So the other important thing about the Burkholderia pseudomelia is that it can survive in extreme conditions. Distilled water for more than 16 years, nutrient depleted soil, and even India, they have found that wound irrigation fluids, antiseptics, and hash hand wash detergents carry this organism. So coming back to the epidemiology, a bit of epidemiology of melioidosis. So if you look at the map, you can see the tropical belt and you can see there is a big blue dot on our tiny island. So there are a lot of cases reported from Sri Lanka as well as there are a lot of case fatalities of melioidosis. So that is why we thought we will select melioidosis as one of the topics today to, uh, to, uh, to sort of discuss the gravity and the importance of meliodosis. Right, so this is a timeline which shows the milestones in the history of meliodosis. So here I would like to draw attention to a couple of uh, milestones. So in 1911, 
it was the disease was reported for the first time in Myanmar. And in 1927, very interesting because the first human case reported of meningoidosis is from Sri Lanka. And I will show you the case report reported in the Sri Lanka Journal of Science that time. And then it was reported in a lot of tropical countries, but it was not considered as a major public threat. There was very little research on this topic. But in 1967 to 1973, nearly 350 cases of meliodosis was reported among American soldiers in Vietnam. So then the whole world was talking about meliodosis and they were trying to explore the treatment strategies and all those things because of this incident. And in 1989, the keftacidine was reported to have effective for meliodrosis. And of course, it has reduced the mortality from 74% to 37%. And then a lot of things happened over the time. And in uh, 2016, the modeling studies predicted that meliodrosis should not be a neglected tropical disease because the, milieu, the modeling study predict that it can account for nearly 90,000 fatalities per year in the tropics. So this is the case report. I couldn't get the authentic uh, sort of photo of the published paper, but this is uh, what I extracted from the internet. So Ceylon Journal of Science in 1927, they described a patient, a European, who was living in Ceylon, who dies because of meliodosis. So they have aspirated pus from the lung shortly before the death. And then that time it was called Burkholderia memori. Uh, and then the organism was fully identified and they gave typical lesions in guinea pigs. So this is the first case report of meliodosis in a human reporting from Sri Lanka. So coming about the roots of infection, yes, it penetrates through the skin. It can be ingested and commonly get inhaled, that is why the pneumonias are common with meliodosis. And interestingly, vertical transmission is also reported from meliodosis, transplacental and through breastfeeding. And importantly, we do a lot of serological studies. We get the serology positive for meliodosis. We get meliodosis antibodies are positive, but to call the patient is having meliodosis, these individuals with this infection who develop clinical symptoms could be either acute or chronic. And then this is again very important point I want to highlight that when we ask from our students and our students, community diseases is up and down list, and we start a new division of the chronic infections. Any patient comes to the bad pneumonia, asophytes, the ice cream. Most Six, <laughs> and I know it's <laughs> 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 
The two previous equations that no and we do not have three respective for many years. So more than 80 percent of the previous equations and more than 20, nearly around 20 percent of adult patients no recognize this. So even in patients who do not have this, who are not diabetic, who are not immune, what would you consider? Various pseudomalaria from the clinical specimens. And it go, it, it, it will go on more spooky laboratory media using standard techniques. But sometimes the identification of this organism in the laboratory can be difficult. So, if early in the cultures, the pseudomalaria and E. coli, they both can have the same appearance. They both form creamy, non demonetic colonies. But usually, after some days, the record area pseudomalia, they can have a slight metallic shield and they become dry and wrinkled. So that is what you can see on day four. You see nice uh, colonies of Burkholderia pseudomalia, which are having a shiny metallic sheen and they become dry and wrinkled. And then the other important thing is uh, in culture, what you see is usually the Burkholderia pseudomalia is resistant to polystyrene and polymixin and also gentamides, but they are sensitive to coamoxiclab. So this is something important because sometimes in our local setting, in our labs, we do get the initial culture report telling that the pseudomonas been isolated, they are doing the other things. And the sensitivity pattern comes as resistant to gentamicin, but sensitive to carbapenems and coamoxiclab. So in that condition, we can think of possibility could this pseudomonas be a called area pseudomania. And then talking about the melioidosis serology, is we use the integrated hemagglutination test and the background seropositive rate in healthy population in some areas are high. And some patients with diabetes and some other immunosuppression may not mount a good antibody response. So the diagnosis of melioidosis, you should not solely rely on the serology, but you have to go to the clinical context and to decide whether you have to take this positive serology as a diagnostic test for melioidosis. And the direct PCR assays, rapid test results than culture, but they are less sensitive, particularly when they are performed on blood. So talking about the treatment of uh, melioidosis, the antibiotic therapy for treatment of melioidosis, the initial intensive therapy should be minimum of 10 to 14 days. And sometimes the recommendation is up to one month. And this actually I've taken from uh, the ID unit where I had my overseas training, the general recommendation was heftacidine if the patient is in the ward and meropenem if the patient is in the ICU. But that is generally because, I mean, they are when the patient is needing the slightest inotropic support, a vasopressor support, or slightest oxygen requirement, the patients are moved to intensive care units. So in wards, we generally manage patients who are very hemodynamically stable. Such patients, and particularly patients with superficial abscesses, can be managed with kepsidine. But if the patient has hemodynamic compromise, deep abscesses, and ill patients will need medical. And here, the dose of kepsidine is two grams intravenously every six hourly, and meropenem you can go for one gram intravenously eight hourly. And in, if you suspect neurological melioidosis, the preferred would be to go for meropenem, but to achieve adequate CSF penetration we will have to double the dose. And patients with neurological melioidosis, osteomyelitis, septic arthritis, and soft tissue infections, and the genital urinary infections, including the abscesses, we generally tend to start the oral eradication therapy alone with the initial intensive phase. And then some patients, particularly those with complicated pneumonia, deep-seated infections, neurological melioidosis, Osteomyelitis and septic arthritis will need a longer in intensive phase, maybe going for four to eight weeks. And this is again important the therapeutic response. This is something that we do see in our clinical practice. Yes, the patient is uh, diagnosed to have melioidosis. We start meropenem, 
but the fever doesn't settle maybe up to five to six days. So the median time for resolution of fever, the median time for the defervescence can go up to nine days. So you have to have some patients, you treat the patient with adequate doses and let the fever settle by lysis than by crisis. And then talking about eradication therapy, yes, the general recommendation is trimethoprim, sarcomethoxazole, or trimethazole along with folic acid. But in patients who have contraindications who develop uh, side effects those with sulfa allergy, for the second line medications, we can uh, use coamoxiclam or doxycycline. And particularly patients with longer eradication therapy, the patients with neurological melioidosis and osteomyelitis will need a longer eradication therapy. And adjoint therapy, the place for granulocyte congestion <laughs> factor, this, a lot of trials being done, and this was used empirically in patients with septic shock, and this is basically to counteract the functional neutrophil uh, defects. So there are evidence for and against it, so at the moment, there are no such recommendation that unless patient is profoundly neutropenic to go for GCSF for field gastric. And talking about the long-term sequelae, the most severe disability is the new residual neurological deficit, which is subsequent to melioidosis associated encephalomyelitis. And also the melioidosis related uh, musculoskeletal involvement, particularly uh, the septic arthritis, osteomyelitis, Again, there can be long-term sequelae with uh, sinus tract formation and deformities, etc. So talking about uh, melioidosis vaccine, <laughs> at the moment, there's no melioidosis vaccine available. So there are a lot of studies going on uh, to create a vaccine. One is to go for a live attenuated vaccine, which will give a more comprehensive immune response. But uh, the safety is an issue. And uh, then the other thing is they have tried a subunit-based vaccine as an alternative because there is increased safety and we can go for a larger, larger scale production of this vaccine. Right, so that brings to the end of my short presentation and uh, I'm happy to accept any questions if you have. Broadcasting is not clear. Why this is not clear? Yeah, yeah. They said that voice is not clear. It's live very tight. Okay. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. is it all right now? Can you can you hear clearly? Yes. Oh. Yes, it's better now. Right. I think. Um... In the absence of any other questions, I will wind up my lecture and uh, I will invite Dr. Sajid to the seat. Thank you so much for that val uh, valuable lecture. So next in the line, we are having uh, Dr. Professor Uday Ralupana, who is a professor in medicine uh, from University of Peradeniya. So I cordially invite Professor Uday Ralupana uh, to start the lecture. Thank you. 
good afternoon uh, can you hear me hello can you hear me yes. okay. Sorry. Okay. right uh, first of all uh, i would like to thank uh, slma and council and the uh, director crtm peradinia uh, for giving this opportunity so my topic is um, uh, you know update on presentation and clinical management of dengue So as you are aware, to develop dengue fever or dengue infection, there should be three factors. One is uh, there should be a virus and the mosquito should be there. Then the susceptible human being should be there. So because of the interaction of these three factors, we can get dengue. So the, so the mosquito is uh, Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus, as you are aware. Both, viruses, uh, both uh, vectors are in Sri Lanka. And the virus is uh, uh, the, the, the dengue virus, and uh, that also available in Sri Lanka. And you know, uh, this is the mosquito. Appearance is beautiful, but uh, the, the the end effect is not that good. So the, when you are do, dealing with uh, some uh, irradiation program uh, to the mosquito, this life cycle is very important because uh, this mosquito's life cycle, uh, about uh, five days, it is happening in water and uh, the rest of the cycle happening in the air. So if you want to, to clean the environment, the, if you understand this basic, every five, six days, you have to clean the environment to get rid of, get rid from this larvae and pupa. So just doing uh, once a month uh, or once a year, uh, Stramadhan is not helpful to eradicate this mosquito. So if you are planning, do it at least once a week. So the, as I said, this uh, vi virus is a RNA virus, belongs to uh, Prevy virus family group. And there are four types of viruses, uh, you know, can, which can cause dengue. And uh, what happened when the, the, infect, the infected child is there and a healthy mosquito is uh, now taking the blood meal and uh, within mosquito's body, uh, there will be a, another life cycle cause extrinsic life uh, incubation period. So during this time uh, inside the mosquito's body, this multi, the viruses multiply. Then when this infected mosquito uh, bites or takes the blood meal from the healthy child, the viruses will introduce into the body. And uh, so the, within the, this healthy person body, there will be a, the intrinsic incubation period, which can go up to three to 14 days. So that means if you are bitten by the infected mosquito, so the minimum period that, uh, you know, that at least there should be three days you to develop the symptoms and even within two weeks time, you can get a symptom because of this infected mosquito. So there, there are different classification for dengue infection. Uh, according to 1997 classification, you can see uh, dengue virus infection is uh, basically divided into asymptomatic and symptomatic. Symptomatic uh, infection divided into three categories, that's undifferentiated fever, dengue fever, and dengue hemorrhagic fever. And later in 2009, this classification improved and uh, now the 2009 WHO case definition is the dengue virus infection divided into asymptomatic and symptomatic. Majority people are asymptomatic. About 80% uh, people who infected are asymptomatic. When it is symptomatic, that means you are getting symptoms like fever and those things. So it could be undifferentiated fever. And dengue fever is you are having the classical features of dengue infection. And uh, the other category is a severe dengue infection. Under that, there are three headings severe plasma leakage or what we call as a dengue hemorrhagic fever. And this is severe bleeders. They are not the leakers, they are bleeding people. And other one is a severe organ impairment, mainly liver. Uh, the, the, they can get a liver, kidney, brain, and even cardiac involvement. The, this slide is very important to understand the uh, you know, pathophysiology and uh, clinical scenario of uh, dengue. So the, if it's a dengue fever, there are two paces, uh, this uh, febrile pace and recovery pace. If someone is going to dengue hemorrhagic fever, the, there are three paces, febrile, critical, recovery. The both uh, types, you know, dengue hemorrhagic fever and the dengue fever, the febrile pace is the same. So the, during this period, pa patient get a fever, usually fever lasts for four days. And there will be a dramatic reduction of uh, the fever in most cases, but there can be exceptions. And the main problem during this febrile phase is a dehydration. So they can get the aches and pains, uh, you know, they can get a 
severe back pain. That's why this uh, disease was called earlier as a breakbone fever in the past. And uh, so the so pain, aches and pain, the dehydration, vomiting, those are the main problem during the febrile phase. And even the febrile phase, if the patient is fairly okay, you can manage at home. But at the end of the second day or third day, you have to be careful because uh, usually the complications start uh, towards the end of the third or beginning of the fourth day. But if the child is alone, if the, your father or mother is alone at home, vomiting, so I think you need to look for uh, the medical attention. And the during the febrile phase, you have to control the fever and both the uh, medication and the physical methods. And then make sure the child or your parents getting adequate nutrition. And uh, if patient is vomiting, need some medication and you can look after at home, especially one, two days. And after that, we have to be, you have to be careful when you are managing patient at home. And uh, so during this period, the severe viremia is there. That's why you are getting this aches and pain and the fever. And uh, if you want to do investigation, uh, at the end of the second day, like you can do a full blood count. And uh, if you want to confirm, you can do NS1 antigen also. Remember, the NS1 antigen can be positive about 98% of the primary infection. And it is only percent, uh, positive about 70% of uh, secondary and tertiary infection. So absence or negative NS1 doesn't rule out uh, dengue. That's the most important thing. Sometimes you will think, though my, my child is having fever, it is NS1 negative, so not a dengue. So that is wrong. If the picture is like dengue, all this uh, disregard of this report, you have to consider that the, your child is having dengue fever and manage accordingly. So the, um, at the end of the febrile phase, that is about uh, end of the third or fourth day, the pa patient fever uh, settled and most of the people, they enter into the recovery phase. So that's a recovery phase will last for another two, three days, and then they are completely back to normal. And uh, so then the febrile phase, uh, you have to consider about the fluid management. Nowadays, what we recommend, uh, try to uh, continue oral fluid if patient is tolerating about 100, 120 mm -hmm. milliliter per hour and uh, daytime. And when they are sleeping around nine, uh, 10 o'clock, you can have a glass of water and uh, then sleep. And uh, then after three, four hours, you can get up and have a another glass of water. So the if patient is vomiting, yes, you have to admit, you may need to admit the child during the febrile phase. And uh, you have to consider even the intravenous fluid combined with oral fluid. And the, when the patient is recovering, the patient feeling well-being and uh, the fever settled, no body pain, and uh, the, 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 they are feeling okay. Sometimes they can get uh, itching, uh, uh, mainly the hands and feet, and sometimes they will get a uh, recovery rash. So they go home. But the problem happens when patient is entered into the critical phase. That's what we have to be careful. Especially that toward the end of the third or beginning of the fourth day, you have to suspect the leaking phase or critical phase. So if how do you detect this? Especially the, if the patient is in the hospital or at home, so there are, uh, you know, important physical symptoms and signs that we can detect leaking early. So these are the symptoms. Symptoms means uh, what are the what are things they can feel. So the first thing they can get a nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, postural dizziness, and uh, the any mucosal bleeding. If those are there, you have to suspect whether the patient is going to get complication. But the complication that's a leaking, and. Uh, if, then uh, your doctor will examine your the patient, and the, if the periphery is uh, the whole, if the, if the CRFT that's a, you know the you know how to do the CRFT, it is prolonged more than two minutes and uh, two seconds, and uh, then uh, if the abdomen tender or hypochondrial tenderness, low blood pressure or narrow pulse pressure, you have to suspect this is uh, you know the patient is leaky. If the, your patient is in the hospital, definitely we do the ultrasound scan, uh, the bedside ultrasound scan, and we can confirm leaking. And uh, we do the blood count and the PCV, which is a very important uh, the investigation uh, in this scenario. If the PCV is rising, when the patient is taking the adequate breed, the, the PCV is rising trend, then you have to think whether the patient is going to leak. So those patients should be managed in the ward and under close observation uh, by the medical team. And uh, the, the, our nurses also involved in, uh, in monitoring this patient. And we have special charts, the red chart and the blue chart. We will discuss it later. So using those uh, charts, regular examination, regular investigation, we manage this uh, dengue hemorrhagic patient uh, the, the mainly during the next uh, 
48 to 72 hours usually. Because the interesting thing with dengue is this uh, critical phase is lasting for 48 hours. But it can vary. But majority of the patients recover by 48 hours. They are, the leaking time is stopped. So uh, we'll discuss that later, fluid management and everything later. And if you do the blood initiation, you can see the laboratory findings. The, the green color one is a platelet, black color one is a WBC. You can see first to drop is a WBC count. It will drop and then it is start to rise. And the platelet, you can see gradual dropping and there is a sudden drop at the end of the fever and there's a sharp drop. And then the platelet will start to rise this later. But that's the pattern you commonly see in dengue patients during their, uh, their clinical scenario. And if you do the, the antigen test, as I said, it, is, it will be positive within the first four, four days. And then if you want to do antibody test, you usually do after five days time, then you may see the positive IgM antibody if you suspect in this primary infection. So the, we don't know why this, uh, the, the leaking phase lasting only for 48 hours. By the postulation is now the, you know there are a lot of cytokines because of this uh, viral infection, and the viral these antibodies and the viral particles will attach to the endothelium. As a result of that, there is a widening of the gap junction. So these are the gap junction. So widening. So the, then what will happen? Plasma will come out from this gap junction. Interestingly, this will last only for forty-eight hours. So then either this. Uh, Cytokines should disappear by that time, or there is some mechanism which can give rise to the, this uh, reversal of gap junction to normal uh, uh, the type. Then leaking is uh, stopped. And uh, so that's why we have to manage this patient mainly for the 48 to 72 hours. If you can manage this uh, person during this time without any failures, I think you can save the life. So this is the pattern, uh, the red color, you can see the, the stars slowly and uh, gradually peak by uh, end of the one day and then gradually it is slowed down toward the end of the second day. Accordingly, the, you can see the PCV start to rise and peak uh, in 48 hours and it is go down. But you have to remember if the patient is getting adequate fluid, you won't see this kind of pattern because we are intervening. This is for the patient who is not having any intervention, right? So the, according to 2009 classification, as I said, there are type two types, barely dengue with warning signs and the uh, severe dengue. So these are the warning signs I uh, mentioned earlier, abdominal pain or tenderness, persistent vomiting, clinical uh, fluid accumulation, that is ascites or pleural effusion, mucosal bleeding, it could be gum bleeding or increased menstrual bleeding, lethargy or restlessness, uh, the patient uh, fever settling by all the time patients sleepy not alert, only suspect leaking, and the liver tenderness, and the, the laboratory wise increased hematocrit, you have to suspect whether the patient is getting warning symptoms and signs needing some intervention. So the, when patient is trans, uh, transitioned from the febrile phase to critical phase, you can see uh, it happened usually fourth and seventh day of the illness, and uh, sometimes it can be early as third day, or it could be late as seven, eight days time. And uh, it can, it happening usually at the uh, at the beginning of the fever settlement. So the these are the warning signs I mentioned. The laboratory findings are usually they can get a leukopenia, and the, they can get a thrombocytopenia, and they can get the rising platelet count, rising PCV. And uh, what is the importance of abdominal pain? As I mentioned, if the child is or the patient is complaining abdominal pain towards the end of the third four, they always suspect whether the patient is going to get leaking. And abdominal pain is a, you know, don't disregard it as a gastritis. It is an early sign of uh, the leaking. Then uh, the vomiting, yes, again, if the child or patient is vomiting at the, towards the end of the third fourth day, always suspect whether the patient is going to leaking. And the, as I said, lethargy, usually when the patient fever is settling, they should, uh, you know, become more alert and active. But if the child or the patient is sleeping all the time on the bed, and no interest to take meal or drink, anything. So always suspect whether the patient is leaking. And the presence of mucosal bleeding, as I said, it is a early warning signs of the leaking. And the, how about laboratory investigation? As I said, usually the uh, dropping of the, the sudden dropping of the platelet count is a, a sign of uh, leaking and the rising PCV also sign of leaking. 
So the interesting thing is, uh, you know, no, the, nowadays we see uh, the, the another entity of the dengue, what we call as a expanded dengue syndrome. Out of that severe manifestation of dengue, one is a hepatic dysfunction. So our experience that we have seen uh, in Sri Lanka, now the management of uh, dengue by treat management is very good. But we have seen that most of the dying people are dying because of the hepatic dysfunction or hepatic failure. So especially, the, you can see about a uh, few, few rise of SGPT, OT, maybe up to 200, 300. It is commonly seen in dengue fever, dengue hemorrhagic fever patient. But the person, uh, SGPT or OT rising more than 1,000, you have to be very careful. Especially the contributing factors are, one thing is a direct viral invasion. Other one is a, if the person getting the hypotension and ischemia to the liver, that also reason to elevate this uh, liver function test. And uh, they can get a neurological manifestation, uh, especially if, they, you, if your patient is drowsy or you know, the, uh, you know, not alert. And uh, so like uh, encephalopathy patient, always suspect this is due to hepatic encephalopathy and they can get encephalitis also. It usually recovers within uh, four, uh, seven, eight days, they usually recover. And we have seen uh, dengue patient with transsmilitis, Guillain-Barre syndrome, uh, the ADEM and that kind of thing. So it is a common, uh, not a rare, you can see those findings in your patient uh, during the dengue management time. Then the other important thing is the abdominal compartment syndrome. This is a serious complication. The contributing factors are the leaking as well as the your external fluid management. So they get a very tense abdomen and the abdominal pressure can go up to more than uh, 50 millimeter mercury. And uh, with that, if they have the oliguria or anuria, respiratory decompression, shock or hypotension and metabolic acidosis, uh, then you have to suspect if those uh, two of those there, you have to suspect a patient is having uh, abdominal compartment syndrome. Then the myocardial infarction, so that is not rare. So we have observed some kind of myocardial infarction. And uh, remember, even you are the person is having myocardial infarction, if the patient is in leaking phase, you have to adjust your fluid management, but don't compromise your fluid management because treat management is very important. You have to get echocardiogram and those things, and uh, you know always titrate the risk benefit and manage the patient. And uh, you may need to give fluid uh, to cover this uh, dengue leaking phase. And the, in our setup, we have seen dengue patient with leptospirosis, dengue patient with other illnesses, dengue with the recurrent infection. So if your patient picture, the clinical picture is not the typical of dengue, and your blood value is also not the typical of dengue and always suspect whether there is a co-infection of the other kind of common infection in our country like leptospirosis, enteric fever, malaria. It is not common, but I heard one person uh, death report recently and the bacterial meningitis. So remember those infection also can co-exist with the dengue. So the most important uh, change happened in Sri Lanka dengue management was the dengue fluid uh, management. I think after that, there was a revolutionary in, uh, the, the increase of the outcome of dengue management in Sri Lanka and a lot of lives saved. And our clinician, our physician are well trained about this fluid management. And even our, uh, the Ministry of Health, they published very useful book. And we recently updated that book also. And uh, that says the fluid management save your patient life as well as you reduce the complication that's a fluid overload. So the, what is the cause of plasma leak? As I said, in the endothelial dysfunction, that is lasting only for 48 hours in most of the patient. So this fluid management, very important during this 48 hours time. So as a consultant, as a senior doctor, you may need to stay with the doctor. Sometimes you can't leave the patient during this time. This is very critical. If you do very small mistake, it is irreversible. So all this, this fluid management is very important. You have to closely monitor the patient. If the patient is not receiving uh, any intravenous fluid or adequate fluid, rising uh, pay, uh, PCV by 20%, we suspect whether the patient is having leaking. But remember, most of our patients getting adequate uh, fluid, and even in the ward, they are getting adequate fluid. So we don't see this 20% of rise of SCT. But your patient rising trend of PCV with other warning symptom signs always uh, manage this patient as a leaking patient. If the patient admitting with a circular failure, yes, that means almost four, uh, 24 hours gone uh, uh, during his uh, leaking phase and you have to manage the shock patient. 
and the presence of uh, SIT and plural effusion in your ward patient too late. That means you have missed the bus, that you missed the diagnosis of uh, leaking. So that should not be the ward practice. Dropping uh, bleeding and the cholesterol, those are important, uh, the laboratory investigation, but don't depend on those. It is uh, your clinical judgment. And uh, you know you have to suspect all this whether a patient is going to leak during the next few hours time. So you had to see a lot of patients and get enough experience. So in Thailand, like country, when we had a train in there, we saw that they are doing a lot of X-ray X-ray investigation in their country to detect uh, the the leakage. So this is the lateral X-ray. You can see the fluid. But fortunately, and we are lucky that uh, our system, our hospital, we receive adequate number of uh, ultrasound uh, scanning uh, by the dengue uh, the program. And uh, we do bedside uh, scanning. That's a very useful. And I think it is recommended uh, to improve even to the base hospital and any hospital to supply this kind of uh, scanning. Very useful. Our doctors even no need to have the consultants. Our registrars and researchers, they are trained to do this investigation. And another important test uh, is uh, this micro centrifuge and using this uh, micro centrifuge uh, capillary tubes. We do the PCV. The, it takes about two, three minutes to get the report, bedside report. So that's a very useful uh, the facility to provide to even the, uh, the base, base hospital level because we don't know when we are going to get the next uh, dengue pandemic in Sri Lanka. So two, 2017, we got a very the bad uh, epidemic in Sri Lanka. And after COVID, I think a lot of the dengue patients gone down, but now we can see again the rising trend of the dengue patient. So having knowledge among our staff, our junior doctors and peripheral doctors, very important because for example, you, you come across a patient suspecting uh, the dengue leak, low BP. So what do you have to do not to transfer immediately, first to stabilize, give fast, uh, I will discuss it later. So I will do that management and then communicate with the nearest uh, the tertiary care hospital and transfer the patient. When patient you know, shock shocked in dengue, what are the causes? Common cause is a plasma leakage. So un, uh, unmatched plasma leakage can give rise to the, the shock in this patient. But there are some other factors that you have to think about. Sometimes the bleeding, it could be external or internal bleeding. Hypocalcemia. You may come across sometimes when we are managing the, the bad dengue leak, we give uh, even the calcium without checking the calcium level. Six hours we repeat the calcium because hypocalcemia can uh, contribute to profound shock. And the vasculopathy, vascular involvement is another thing, you know, which can contribute to shock. And um, inadequate fluid management, so you are not giving adequate fluid to compensate this uh, leaking, so it can cause. And the other thing is a myocardial. These are the factors which can contribute. What happens if you don't correct this plasma leakage, patient will go to shock, then patient will end up with a prolonged shock. So if the patient, patient goes to prolonged shock, I am sorry to say it's very difficult to reverse. I think you are dealing with the dying person. So always remember not to miss this plasma leakage and shock in early stage and do the corrective measurements. Otherwise, when the patient going to prolong shock, organ hyperperfusion and the organ impairment, they can get a metabolic acidosis and DIC, they can start severe bleeding, they can die. We have seen this kind of patient, that's why we are telling, do the correct fluid management and save the life. So uh, when your PCV rising in the, the patient, uh, the, if the PC goes up, by 20 to 30%, they say there is a gut ischemia. That's why they are getting this uh, abdominal pain and the, the liver ischemia. That's why you are getting the uh, high STPTOT and the tenderness. And when it is going, uh, the PC further rise, 30 to 40%, you can get a brain and the renal impairment. So you can see the multi organ failure. So, there, who are the people at major risk of bleeding? Because we have seen this uh, bleeding tendency especially people uh, had a prolonged or refractory shock, hypertensive shock or renal or liver failure, severe and persistent metabolic acidosis, who receive uh, NSID. That's why always we advise not to give any uh, diclopenac sodium, brupen, mepidemic acid-like treatment for a febrile patient. And uh, who had a patient previous history of peptic cancer disease, anyone who is on anticoagulation or antiplatelet treatment, anyone who is getting uh, IMD injection, you know, when we were small, uh, it was a common practice to give a uh, diclopenac injection for the fever patient. Fortunately, that practice is not more in Sri Lanka, but uh, still some countries like even the Italy, they practice this uh, injection system for the fever patient. But uh, we are not doing this practice among our doctors. Now they are very uh, educated about this. 
So the most important thing dengue management is a dengue uh, fluid management. I hope you all know about this. The, you have to calculate fluid quota according to this formula. It is given in our the, the ministry guideline book. So the person uh, usually, the 50 kilo of our patient, usually we give 4,600 for the 48 hours time. So there may be little variation, but this is the amount we are using maximally during that time. We are planning to, or we are trying our best to manage this patient 48 hours within this fluid quota. So adequate or rational fluid management, it avoids the shock and it avoids fluid overload. That's very important. So the, the, during the dengue febrile phase in your patient, when at home or in the hospital, you can give paracetamol for the fever. If vomiting, give some antiemetics. Try to control fever with the physical method. Avoid aspirin and any non steroid anti drugs and give the, uh, the adequate fluid. Don't give too much fluid during the febrile phase. Otherwise, they can end up with fluid overload during the, the, the recovery phase. And the, if someone is having leaking, but not in shock, we have seen a lot of patients, they are leaking, but they are smiling, they, they are comfortable, but they are leaking. So the, that kind of person, so you can start uh, IV and oral, and initially 1.5 ml per kg, that means for the uh, 50 kilogram person patient, uh, you can give 75 milliliter, both oral and IV. Then you can uh, monitor urine output, and uh, expect about 0.5 ml per kg. That means the 50 kilogram person, 25 to 30 milliliter per hour is adequate. And the, yeah. if the PCV is starting rising, you can gradually increase your fluid, uh, 3, ml, 3 ml per kg per hour. Like that, you gradually increase the uh, fluid amount while monitoring the parameters and the clinical improvement and the PCV. And the, so the, what are the fluid commonly we use? The main thing is crystalloid. That's a normal saline. You have to make sure saline is available in your hospital and you are the ETU or a PCU. And uh, colloid are very useful. The dextran is the one we are mainly used, 40% uh, dextran. And 6% uh, heta starch also we are using, but uh, I don't have enough experience. I have used two, three times only. But the dextran is better than uh, the heta starch. That's my experience. So the, make sure your unit is always having some dextran bottles with you because when the leaking, so it is a, it is a nightmare, you know, sometimes you have to use, you have to flush this treat. So make sure it is available in your unit when you are managing dengue patient. So the, what are the common indication for colloid? So the failure of crystalloid boluses to normalize pulse pressure or blood is one indication. And the, if the patient is developing shock, and fluid dolos features, then your selection should be the colloid. And uh, uh, the, especially when the fluid quota is exceeding, you can try use colloid. When use colloid, it stay in the intravascular compartment for most of the time, the prolonged period, and it will help reabsorption of the extravasated fluid dose. So it will help the diuresis also. So the, uh, the usually the, the, for, the, for the patient, usually we can use three doses of dextran during the 24 hours time and five doses of 6% heta start during the 24 hours time. So the, how do you know improvement uh, for, of the patient for your fluid uh, management? So it is a clinical improvement. Always check with the patient, are you feeding okay? If patient clinically, physically feeding better, looks well, that's a good thing. And the peripheries will become warm and capillary refill time will become less than 2%. Blood pressure will become improved. And the, the, these are the other features, tachycardia will go down. So those are the indication uh, that patient is responding to your fluid management. Then you can do the PCV and PCV will come down. So the patient goes to a prolonged shock, as I said earlier, it's not a good thing and uh, the chance of recovery is very low. So your objective is to prevent patient is going to uh, the, the prolonged shock. So when patient is coming with the shock state to the hospital, this is how you manage. So the, give oxygen, keep plateau head low position, uh, assess IV access, and give some rapid boluses of fluid. Always monitor ABCS. What do you mean by ABCS? A is acidosis, B is a blood bleeding, C is calcium, S is sugar. So uh, monitor those things in a patient uh, with the shock state. And uh, all say also consider other, other causes of shock, as I mentioned earlier, like bleeding, some other infection like also, and the calcium also you have to think about, and always make sure you are entering your findings in BAT. 
So that kind of patient who is coming with a shock with a hypertension, you can give liberal amount of fluid, start with a normal saline, give fast bolus within half an hour to one hour, see the response, no. Use the second bolus of uh, histoloid, that's a normal saline, see the response, no. Then give the full first uh, one pint of uh, colloid, that is the, you give the dextran and look for the improvement. If no improvement, then uh, you better do the PCV. If the PCV is still high, then it's, the patient is still leaking, then you have to think about the second bolus of uh, uh, dextran and see the response. If the PCV has dropped inappropriately and patient is not responding to your conventional treatment, patient, patient PC has dropped inappropriately, so this is a, the, the bleed. So you are, the fluid of choice should be the blood transfusion. So the, so the patient not responding to treatment, as I mentioned earlier, look for the massive plasma leakage, concealed bleeding, hypocalcemia, hypoglycemia, hyponatremia, and acidosis. Those are things that you have to carry. So during the recovery phase, you try to cut down fluid as soon as possible. If the patient is stable, stop IV fluid as much, soon as possible. Otherwise, it will cause fluid overload. And use oral fluid if patient is tolerating. And uh, mild rise of the PCV during this recovery phase, don't worry about. It will come down to the lower level later. If the patient clinically is stable and the fatal rising, then patient is recovering. So the severe bleeding, the, you can use the blood, as I said. So you can give 10 ml per kg whole blood or 5 ml per kg packed blood cell during this uh, bleeding time. So the, these are some indications for blood transfusion in dengue patient. The, the management of dengue with the blood products is uh, hardly seen. I can remember one of the very sad story. One of my batchmate fears, uh, he was a medical register in, in NHS cell, and um, he got dengue long ago uh, when we were in the second day, as I remember. And uh, he his blood pressure, his blood plate dropped. So those days, the management mainly aimed at uh, the plate management. So the, those days, uh, doctors thought that this is a disease of plate. But patients were dying not because of the plate this is leak. That uh, my friends, uh, the peers was given uh, plate transfusion. Uh, when the plate count was 20,000, patient during the reaction, he died. So that was a very pathetic story. I always I remember when you know the, now we know the pathophysiology of dengue and we know how to manage the dengue. We hardly use uh, any plate or blood product, but we use the blood in some cases, right? So the, these are the common investigation. I think you are familiar, blood count, uh, the grouping and cross match for the needy patient, blood sugar, electrolytes, liver function, renal function, some patient blood gases and coagulatory patient in needy patient. But the most important test uh, in dengue management is a PCV. So make sure that your hospital is a mi micro centrifuge. And uh, you know, it is not very expensive, about one lakh or 150,000 uh, rupees. So make sure you know they get down from the dengue unit, uh, the Ministry of Health. Also, if you write, they will provide you. It's a very useful life-saving investigation. No, even no need to have full blood count when you are managing dengue patients. So the fluid overload. Uh, these are the causes for fluid overload. Too much fluid in the febrile phase, and uh, unnecessary rapid uh, fluid replacement. And uh, sometimes you are using inappropriate fluid. For example, normal saline instead of normal saline, you are using half saline. Or the dexose, then again, the, you can get a fluid dollar. So the crystalloid of choice is saline. And uh, so like that, uh, you have to address these issues to avoid fluid dollar. And uh, so the, what are the clinical features, early clinical features of fluid dose? Main uh, the symptoms and signs are the respiratory distress. They find difficult to be, the, they get a breathing difficulty and they are tachypneic and the, they, they, they are, you know, saturation will drop. And the, when you, Percuss the chest, you can see the presence of effusion. And uh, so how to manage the fluid load? You try to cut down fluid as soon as possible, and you can turn the patient to left lateral position and nurse in this position, and try to keep saturation about 95. So you can try dextran with uh, prusamide. As I said earlier, when you give the dextran, the fluid will uh, come into the intravascular compartment. When you give a small dose of diuretics, they get a diuresis. So, so correct hypokalemia and uh, admit address the ABCS as I mentioned earlier. So the when you can see the key points of the managing dengue, you have to recognize 
the star time of dengue. So sometimes our junior doctors uh, ask questions, sir, how did you think, uh, you know, patient start leaking about six hours ago? How, how, how did you think uh, the patient started uh, leaking about 12 hours ago? That is our experience. And, and uh, you know, that you have to see a lot of patients. And if you see a lot of patients, you will get that experience. They always ask about the patient's symptoms. Sometimes patient will take Dr. Matagira, Badai Kattumava. You know, what was the time? Radolat, midnight. So that may be the time that you may back your red chart. Maybe I will tell if the morning I am coming to old town, if the patient says I got a back pain and won't be mid, uh, 12 in the midnight, I assume maybe six, eight hours before patients start leaking. Or just close to see your PCV, PCV trend is rising. That may be the time, time patients start leaking. So the during our dengue management is a teamwork. So the monitoring is very important. So even the temperature chart is very important. So the dengue doesn't, you know, the cost a lot of money to manage. You know, it is mainly the close observation and the human resources as a main key factor in dengue management. So this is the microcentrifuge I mentioned. Uh, this is in our ward, uh, Professor of Medical Unit Peradenia. So this is, uh, I think, they are for so many years, no problem much. You know, they're very good machine. And uh, you, you you should have this kind of machine if you are managing dengue patient and try to get down some uh, you know portable uh, blood pressure apparatus and some monitors. The, those days, uh, our dengue Colombo unit supplied us on our request. So these should be there when you are managing patient. So this is the red chart I am referring. So this is very important. The, the nurse's duty to manage the right everything here. Doctor's duty is to keep eye on this and take the action appropriately. So this is the chart that we mainly go by when we are managing dengue. So different charts, I can show you. There are you know, different charts we use in our ward patient management. This is a blue chart we call, and this is for the dengue you, normal person, dengue fever patient management. Mm -hmm. So usually we start with a blue chart, and when the patient is leaking, we, we shift to the blue chart, uh, red chart, and uh, it will use only for 48 hours. Then uh, if the patient recovering again, we they go back to blue chart for the same patient. And uh, this is another chart you see in the ward, there's an intake output chart. So those simple things are very important in dengue management. So this is a book I mentioned. Uh, the, this is the book uh, published in, uh, I think, two, uh, 2012. Uh, very useful book. And uh, we should get, you pay our gratitude to all the authors who the, did this book, because this is a very useful book. Even I learned a lot uh, from this book. And uh, I recommend all of you to read this book. It is available in the internet as a PDF format. Recently, our CCP and we enrolled in uh, revising this book and a new one will be available. Till then you can read this one. To finish my lecture, the, this is one of the slides I like to present. So th those days we thought the dengue is uh, because of this, the low plate wealth. That's why we lost our friends, uh, the peers also, because that day, those days, we thought that this is a disease of platelet. But I, have, I would like to say this is not a platelet disease. Don't keep on eye about the platelet count. I have still seen a lot of doctors always say platelet is like this. When you are telling the pullback count report, tell the white count, that is important. Then tell you a hematocrit. That is the next thing uh, according to the order. Last thing in that list also platelet. So give the least priority to platelet. Platelet will help you to get some idea whether a patient is going to leak and patient with their patient is recovering. So the, the so remember, dengue is a systemic and dynamic disease. It is not the, just a platelet disease. With that, I would like to conclude my lecture. I am happy to answer any uh, question if you are having. <laughs> Regarding many advances now. Just scroll up. That's all. Yeah. Yeah, that is regarding the previous. Right. 
Right, and the, at the end of the, this presentation, uh, in the absence of any question, uh, I would like to thank all the audience and the SLMA and the CR team uh, for giving this opportunity. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Udir Alpanal, for that excellent presentation. Recently, from SLMA, we conducted a SLMA doc call 247 regarding that uh, dengue uh, pandemic also, how to be aware about that. A lot of questions came up uh, with this fluid management. So thank you very much. We will be sharing this video again on uh, SLMA YouTube channel. So whoever, whoever participated, on the last uh, session for the SLMA doc call 247 also can refer into this monthly clinical meeting uh, about this dengue fluid management as well. So next, uh, the last speaker uh, of this today's monthly clinical meeting, we are having Professor Manoji Patirage. So she will be talking to us about the central nervous system infections in the tropics. Over to you, Matt. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, SLMA for giving us the CRTM this opportunity. And uh, it's a bit challenging topic because uh, just to uh, brief the central nervous system infections in the tropics in 30 minutes. So I will try my level best uh, to summarize uh, uh, rather than giving a comprehensive one. So let's see. So why it is important because of high mortality, morbidity and LMRs in diagnosis of CNS infections even in the 21st century. So having said that, as we are in the 21st century, most of the disease entities we will be incompatibly diagnosing, but uh, still the CNS infections, it is really difficult to diagnose because of some practical difficulties. We will discuss it later. And it um, poses a unique challenge to physicians due to its lethal nature and inherent difficulties during the confirmation of the diagnosis. And it can, it can occur sporadically, endemically, or as an outbreak. Uh, the spectrum of infection is broad, uh, encompassing meningitis, encephalitis, myelitis, and brain abscesses. These are the more common ones. Apart from that, there are some other entities as well. So on top of that, emerging and re-emerging infections are there. So it further increases the burden in the tropics. And there are several neglected, uh, neglected tropical diseases like neurocysticercosis, Chagas disease, and neurocystosomiasis, which we are seeing in the tropics um, as a uh, re-emerging diseases. And the introduction of the vaccinations in the expected uh, this program of the immunization has reduced the burden of some of the bacterial and viral pathogens, especially like meningitis. So therefore, we will be seeing the emerging and re-emerging of the other disease ent entities when we are discussing the CNS infections. So here that <clears throat> I have uh, shown the tropical belt with various colors. Uh, so these are the predominant CNS infections in the tropical belt. I would like to thank my pre-intern who was there with me three years ago, Malaka, uh, for producing this uh, uh, the map for me. Uh, so here that the green color one, which is the West Nile virus, which you can see 
are more pre predominant in the African countries and some South African, uh, South American countries. And the brown color one, which is the Marburg virus, uh, Murray Valley virus, which is in the Western part of the Australia. And you can see the Indian subcontinent and this Oceania area, uh, which is in yellow color, which is more predominant in the Japanese encephalitis and the red color meningitis belt, which is in the Africa, which uh, comprises of 26 countries. So this is the most predominant. Having said that, we are having some other disease and entities as well. So the epidemiology of the CNS infection has changed since the introduction of vaccines, as I said earlier. However, the incidence is varied by geographical region. Further, most of the CNS infections are not uh, mandatory to notify in uh, notification forms. So they are, but uh, in, in even in Sri Lanka, the JE is the one which is we are notifying, but rest of the ones are not notifying. So therefore, uh, real incidents, we are not in a position to tell. So therefore, <clears throat> That may be the reason that we don't know about the burden of the CNSC infection in our countries. So the global incidence of meningitis is in, increased from 2.5 million in 1990 to 2.82 million in 2016. However, uh, the worldwide meningitis death rate have decreased by 21%. This is mainly because of the introduction of the vaccine. So the worldwide incidence of encephalitis is 4.3 million people um, and resulted in 150,000 deaths annually, so which is more serious. And in tropical countries, the incidence of encephalitis is 6.34 per 100,000 people per year, which is once again, I think, uh, uh, what we, uh, it is which higher than what we expected. And the incidence of brain abscesses in developing countries is around 8%, which is compared to the 1% to 2% in Western developed world. The prevalence has become much higher among male population as well. <clears throat> so the clinical presentation, it varies according to the disease entity, but the hallmark is fever, headache, alteration of level of consciousness, and presence of some focal neurological signs. Having said that, this could be very depends on the patient's age as well as other comorbidities, especially the elderly population. They will not come with fever headache, but they will come with the altered level of consciousness and some other uh, um, presentations like delirious status. So we may have to always think about whether this could be CNS infection. Diagnosis will be challenging. So the cause of the most encephalitis and meningitis remain unknown because of the problems with diagnostics um, and the uh, difficulties in the isolation of the pathogens in the samples. This could be due to the initial starting of the antibiotics and with, in which the, these pathogens may be very sensitive to even a single dose of antibiotics as well. But having said that, um, serological testings are very limited. So therefore we have to uh, happy with or we have to satisfy ourselves with available clinical diagnosis, diagnostics and other supportive diagnostics. The isolation of the pathogen in brain parenchyma is the gold standard uh, diagnostic method, but which is highly invasive. So therefore, most of us are not going to do that. So therefore, we have to <clears throat> depend mainly on the CSF studies, uh, which we all have learned in our undergraduate uh, uh, era, so therefore I'm not going to show that uh, very famous uh, table in uh, how to diagnose meningitis or encephalitis in CSF. Uh, so, but that is what we are going to depend on the ultimate di diagnosis. And apart from that, there are certain places, some of the uh, serological testings are available. Uh, mainly the viral panels are available in uh, 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 main hospitals. So therefore, we may have to, we, we, we will be able to satisfy with some diagnostics. And etiopathological agents are mainly viruses, bacteria, fungi, parasitic agents, and prions. 
And these um, organisms can lead to meningitis, encephalitis, spinal and cranial abscesses, discitis, and severe complications like cranial nerve palsies and epilepsy. So the example uh, is the neurocysticercosis is the leading cause for preventable epilepsy in most of the developing uh, countries. So I will just go uh, briefly um, about the meningitis, which is a clinical syndrome due to the inflammation of the meninges. Uh, clinically manifest as fever, headache, photophobia, and nuchal rigidity. It could be acute, subacute, and chronic presentation, depends on the etiopathological agent. Early diagnosis and prompt treatment will minimize most of the complications, uh, such as hearing loss, memory impairment, brain damage, seizures, and ultimately the death. Infective cause of meningitis include bacteria, viruses, fungi, and other parasites. So bacterial meningitis, which uh, once again we call as pyogenic meningitis, which is uh, bacterial and viral meningitis are the common ones. And uh, it, is, uh, it was fatal during pre-antibiotic era and before the introduction of the vaccines. Now it is not that uh, bad. Uh, but uh, having said that, it remains alarmingly high in the tropical belt uh, compared to the rest of the countries. Uh, Streptococcus pneumoniae, Neisseria meningitis, and Haemophilus were the commonest organisms, but nowadays we don't see much of the Haemophilus. And among the elderly population, Listeria and gram-negative bacilli are coming to the picture. So therefore, when you are dealing with the elderly person with meningitis, if the person is not responding to the empirical antibiotics, always we may have to suspect about this Listeria and gram-negative bacilli. Uh, TB still in, high up in the list. So there are four the resistant cases. And if the CSF is more suggestive of TB, we may have to think about the TB meningitis as well. So the worldwide incidence of meningitis is higher in region of Sub-Saharan Africa. As you can remember, the red colored uh, belt, which was shown in my previous map. Uh, so it has got 26 countries from Senegal to Ethiopia. Uh, this high pandemic region has got seasonal epidemics of meningitis due to various pathogens. So in 2009, there were 80,000 suspected cases and 4,000 deaths due to meningitis in this region. So you can think about the burden. So viral meningitis, it is the commonest one, and it is mostly the mild disease, which is self-limiting disease. Enteroviruses like Coxsackie, echoviruses are the most common ones. And uh, the, however, the meningitis due to the West, uh, West Nile virus, herpes simplex type 1, 2, varicella, mumps, measles, and rubella viruses are also common in tropical countries, um, mainly in the Asian and Ocean, Ocean, Asia Oceanic area. So meningitis also can cause by fungi and other parasites. Cryptococcus is commonest among the HIV and other immunocompromised adults and other fungal infections like blastomycosis, histoplasma, candida, also prominent among the uh, immune compromised adults. Uh, for the resistant infections with free living amoeba, also we are seeing few cases per annum. And the primary, primary amoebic meningoencephalitis occurs with an acute onset of high fever, photophobia, headache, and altered mental status similar to the bacterial meningitis. So therefore, the suspicion is needed if a patient is not responding to good uh, recommended antibiotic for the bacterial meningitis. Apart from those acute presentations, they can present as uh, subacute nature or chronic uh, nature. Uh, so therefore, if a patient comes with uh, long-lasting fever or PUO, we may have to think about the CNS infections as well. So the diagnosis by the CSF studies and then the treatment empirically will be IV kefotaxim or kefraxone will be the first line of choice. And if we think about the listeria, we are going to add ampicillin. And for the resistant cases, if we think about the MRSA, we are going to add IV mancomycin. Uh, tuberculous meningitis, we are going to treat with anti-TB treatment and antiviral and antifungal uh, drugs are going to add if we suspect about the viral meningitis or fungal meningitis. And uh, compared to the other disease entities, meningitis is a disease entity in which that we use steroids 
uh, for the bacterial meningitis, we will be using for 24 to 48 hours, but for the TB meningitis, we will be using more longer course. So that is about the meningitis and few words about the encephalitis. So encephalitis is the, if the infection goes beyond the meninges and if it invades the brain prior and chyma, we will call it as encephalitis. So it is also more prevalent among the tropical pens. The incidence is 6.34 per 100,000 per year in this region. The severity can be varied. So most of the encephalitis could be self-limiting and severity depends on the causative organism as well. Common pathogens are herpes virus group, HSV1, 2, varicella zoster, EBV, and cytomegaloviruses. <coughs> so with the introduction of the acyclovir, mortality rates have been markedly reduced in HSV encephalitis. And apart from that, we have seen uh, some encephalitic cases due to the um, rabies, which is still remain fatal, and the final diagnosis will be uh, by doing the by um, demonstrating the nuclear bodies in the brain biopsies. So not only the viruses, encephalitis could be due to bacterial pathogens, rickettsia, fungi, and other parasites as well. So. Uh, uh, having said that, we have to keep it in uh, our mind. Apart from the infective etiologies, encephalitis could be due to other autoimmune disorders and other uh, certain medications. So therefore, uh, we have to uh, assess the patients very uh, very carefully uh, related to uh, when we dealing with a patient with encephalitis. So Japanese encephalitis, which is uh, a, a not a notifiable disease, West Nile viral disease, Moray Valley viral fever are some of the more prevalent diseases in this region, which are uh, transmitted by the mosquitoes as well. JE is the main cause for viral encephalitis in many countries of tropical Asia, and it has caused several outbreaks in our country as well. And in our country, there are certain parts that we have isolated as JE belt as well. So the West Nile viral disease is more prevalent in Africa, Middle East and tropical American countries, but we have seen few cases as well. It can cause severe neurological diseases in humans and uh, several outbreaks in Africa and Central America as well. Murray Valley encephalitis is endemic in uh, Northern Western Australia and uh, Papua New Guinea area, which is fatal and usually causes long-term neurological sequelae. So encephalitis could be a result of bacterial meningitis, even though we thought of virus, viral in origin whenever we, we hear a term of encephalitis. Uh, further, it could be due to a certain parasitic invasion, protozoal infestations like malaria, toxoplasma, amoeba, leishmania, and trypanosomiasis. So therefore, we have to suspect these uh, etiopathological agents when we are dealing with a patient. So uh, here also the common symptoms are fever, headache, confusion, and seizures. So compared to the meningitis in encephalitis, most of the time you will see the patients are developing seizures. Neurological examination reveals confusion, drowsiness, you may see the neck stiffness, and sometimes patients may get focal neurological signs, especially um, uh, hemiparesis, or they can get some uh, cranial nerve palsies. So the clinicians must be aware of the mimics of the encephalitis, like uh, due to the vascular disorders, toxic exposure, and other systemic disorders like liver failure, renal failure. So therefore, uh, always you have to think about the other possibilities and you have to uh, maximize the treatment for such uh, disease entities as well. And the uh, diagnosis, once again, uh, you have to suspect and EEG will help you. Uh, but CSF, you have to see whether CSF has shown uh, 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 results of what we are expecting in a patient with uh, meningitis or meningoencephalitis. So uh, mainly the encephalitis is a, a diagnosis by clinical suspicion. Uh, so the viral encephalitis, uh, the uh, yeah, 
finding an etiopathological agent still will be dif difficult because uh, viral cultures and other things will be difficult in CSF. And, uh, but having said that, if you do a CSF study for a patient who are uh, suspecting encephalitis or meningitis, always you have to send a sample for the viral panels. So some of the viral panels we can do uh, serological studies, and then uh, finally we can label the patients as these are the uh, disease entities. So the treatment wise, it will be uh, once again, the uh, available IV antiviral agents like, um, Esaclova and Gansaclova. So those are the available ones. So rest of the things we may have to decide on the uh, rest of the management apart from giving antiviruses. Like if a patient is having uh, seizure disorders, we have to treat the seizures and you have to look after the patient's general health condition and you have to support the patient with the general to upgrade the general health condition. So then the patients will get recovered uh, with less complications. CNS abscesses, uh, uh, regarding the CNS abscesses, it could be brain or spinal cord abscesses. Brain abscesses are more common than the spinal cord abscesses. It could be due to the hemorrhaginous spread or it could be due to the direct spread from the infected sinuses, otitis media, mastoiditis, or meningitis. Uh, according to the current research data, the brain abscesses are more prevalent in male uh, gender than the female, with the male to female ratio varying between 2 to 1 and 3 to 1. So still, uh, they haven't said that what could be the reason. So it could be some habitats and uh, some other predisposing factors as well. In developing countries with poor living standards, brain abscesses account for the majority of the space occupying lesions than in developed world. So streptococcus and staphylococcus species are the commonest organisms. Having said that, gram-negative bacteria like protea species, Klebsiella, E. coli, Burkholderia, and Enterobacteria can, can also cause cerebral abscesses, <coughs> particularly in Asian and African countries. So other organisms like fungal and parasit parasites also can cause brain abscesses, mainly in the immune compromised patients. So common cause for the cord abscess is staph, uh, staph species, and some patients develop cord abscesses due to the tuberculosis as well. Clinical presentation depends on the site and the size of the lesion. So therefore it varies. So if it is in the CNA brain, uh, patients may come with focal neurological signs and fits. If it is in the cord, they may come with a paraparesis or quadriparesis. So uh, they also may present with headache, fever, uh, and other cranial nerve palsies as well. So neuroimaging is the mainstay of diagnosis. Out of the neuroimagings, MRI will be the best mode of uh, imaging. Uh, to uh, come to a conclusion. So frontal and parietal lobes are the commonest sites for the brain abscesses. You need a multidisciplinary approach for such patients because we are going to start empiric antibiotics, but if it is a very big one, you need the neurosurgeon's opinion regarding the aspiration and you need the microbiology opinion regarding what to give and what will be the combinations like. Uh, there can be resistant forms so therefore, you need a multidisciplinary approach when you are managing a patient with uh, CNS abscesses. So finally, I would like to uh, just uh, present about the parasitic infections of the central nervous system. So neurocystic sarcosis is a, emerge, a re emerging parasitic in, uh, infection, which is leading cause of adult epilepsy in developing countries. It affects adults primarily during their third and fourth decades of the life and is fairly rare in children and elderly population. The clinical manifestations are heterogeneous and mainly depend on the host's location of the cyst and immune response. The most common symptoms <coughs> of cysts in the brain parenchyma are the convulsions. So that is why it was labeled as the commonest cause for the uh, adult epilepsy in the tropics. Early phase are in, uh, indicative of fever, rash, lymphadenopathy, and eye disturbances, and later they will develop fever and convulsions. 
uh, spinal cord cystic cirrhosis is rare and patients present with features of root lesions or cord compression symptoms. Then the toxoplasmosis, which is frequently occur in immunocompromised uh, individuals. Um, so it is due to the uh, due to this. Uh, they can present with fever, rash, and lymphadenopathy. Uh, and then when it affects the CNS of the immune compromised hosts, they will present with fever, headaches, confusion, and features of meningitis as well. And then they can develop the ocular disease, uh, uh, such as uh, retinochoroiditis. So therefore, we have to look at that aspect as well. Many infections are subclinical. So transplacental transmission it will be there. So therefore, we have to think about the congenital toxoplasmosis when you are diagnosed mothers with toxoplasmosis as well. Prevention against toxoplasmosis is in susceptible patients require the combination of trimethoprim and sulfamethoxazole. So once you uh, diagnosed, specific therapy with pyrimethamine and sulfadiazin should be initiated. Echinococcosis is once again known as hydatid disease, which is due to the echinococcus granulosis and echinococcus martillocularis. Uh, the, it is an infection by primary or secondary to the spontaneous or traumatic rupture of the primary cerebral cyst or uh, because of the embolization of uh, of the cardiac cysts. Uh, so mainly we, we learn about these cysts uh, in the liver as well in our paras uh, parasitology lectures. So the clinical presentation varies according to the site and size of the lesion. Most of the patients present with seizures and signs of the raised intracranial pressure. Cystosomiasis due to the flukes. Uh, it could be due to cystosomia, mansoni or hematobium. So these two are always associated with spinal infection, while the cystosomia japonicum affected the brain predominantly. So uh, it can cause acute encephalitis in two to three percent of cases, and it is a neglected disease which is re-emerging as well. So cerebral lesions will give rise to space-occupying lesions such as headaches, seizures, and some focal neurological signs. <clears throat> so they can develop multiple nodules in the spinal cord. Cord compression features will be there. And then uh, if, as it is uh, developing the granuloma, you will get the meningeal granuloma and the crowd necrosis as well. Blood and CSF analysis for the cystosomia we can do. Uh, so the, uh, the treatment will be ox uh, oxamine queen or pasiquantel. Uh, which is uh, you have to give a longer duration as well. So malaria, even though we said that uh, we have eradicated in uh, Sri Lanka. So today, while we are traveling from Kandy to Colombo, we got a newspaper alert uh, uh, mentioning about a very sad story. A young person uh, who traveled recently from an African country came here with a fever and succumbed due to malaria and autopsy findings confirmed that it was malaria. So therefore, even though we think that we have eradicated malaria because we do get a lot of um, foreigners and we do get a lot of our pe people traveling to endemic countries. So always if a patient come with high fever, uh, we always have to, with a travel history, we always have to think about the malaria. So it is the commonest parasitic disease in the tropics. It affects primarily Africa and Asia. So cerebral malaria is caused by Plasmodium falciparum, and it results in an acute encephalopathy with seizure, which may be fatal as well. So generalized seizures may be followed by coma. Residual neurological abnormalities are common. Epilepsy and cognitive impairment, behavioral disorders, and gross neurological deficits are frequent sequelae. So the diagnosis will be the demonstration of falciparum in the blood films and then the detection of antigen in the blood. CSF analysis may be warranted in doubtful cases, but usually you will be able to diagnose by blood tests. And <clears throat> the treatment of choice will be artisanate rather than uh, anything else nowadays. Usually we don't use uh, quinine now, it'll be the artisanate. 
So immunological, molecular, and neuroimaging methods can be used to uh, diagnose these parasitic infections overall. And the treatment of the CNS parasitic infections is broad and includes medical as well as surgical care. And always you need a multidisciplinary approach. Medical uh, treatment includes pharmacotherapy with um, antiparasitic drugs and uh, some surgical uh, interventions to uh, minimize the long-term sequelae. And however, there are some exceptions when the risk of treatment outweighs the potential benefits. So therefore, especially when antiparasitic treatment can lead to uncontrollable, uncontrollable dangerous, some um, destructive post inflammatory reactions. But when we are thinking about the benefits, always you may have to uh, think about whether to give it a try or what to do, uh, like when patient has got a lot of systemic symptoms. So this is a, just a summary related to the parasitic infections which are causing the uh, CNS manifestations. So that's about the summary of a CNS infection in traffic. So if there are questions, I'm happy to answer that. So would you kindly let us know the updated epidemiology of amoebic and Burkhard area pseudomalia brain abscesses in Sri Lanka. Are incidents uh, dropping or stable? So of course, I mean, Prasina uh, Noka Korea is here, he, Korea Madam is here, so then she will be able to say about the uh, Burkhard area <laughs> infection epidemiology rather than me. So it's increasing. Yeah, so uh, the cerebral uh, 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 neurological manifestations due to the Burkhard area is incre increasing. And the amoebic also, I think it is uh, because we do get a uh, few case reports which are reported haphazardly. Uh, there were some case reports from Anuradhapura area. So those are uh, with a meningitis. So apart from that, we haven't come across any. So that is uh, that. Those are the two things that I I will be able to say about the epidemiology in Sri Lanka. That's all. Thank you very much. Right. Uh, thank you so much. So that brings to the end of our monthly clinical meeting uh, with the Center for Research in Tropical Medicine, uh, University of Theradenia. So I would like to thank, uh, as the SLMA, to Professor Udair Alapanava, uh, Professor Manoji Patiragi, and Professor Tamara Dalugamua for coming all the way from Peradenia to Sri Lanka Medical Association and delivering these valuable lectures and this rec uh, recorded session will be available on YouTube very soon. So you all can repeatedly uh, refer these valuable lectures and enhance your knowledge.